Good evening, everyone. Good evening. We'd like to uh, get our program started, so if I could have everyone's attention. So uh, welcome to our symposium on new phenotypic susceptibility technology, the impact on clinical microbiology and antimicrobial stewardship. My name is Karen Carroll. I'm from Johns Hopkins University. And this evening, we have a distinguished panel of speakers uh, who will talk about phenotypic and genotypic susceptibility testing and an exciting new technology that could have a significant uh, clinical impact on patient care. And we're very excited to, uh, to talk about this this evening. So without further ado, I think we'll get started. So our first speaker is Dr. Paul Schreckenberger. Dr. Schreckenberger is the director of the Clinical Microbiology Laboratory at Loyola University Medical Center. And the title of his presentation is Resistance Genotype Versus Susceptible Phenotype Beyond Susceptible and Resistant, The Value of the MIC. Dr. Schreckenberger. Uh, thank you, Karen, and uh, thanks to Malcolm and the whole Accelerate staff for putting this symposium together and um, treating you all to dinner. And thank you all for coming. It's a long day. Session starts so early, and you're still at it. I, I commend you. So the outcome of infection is my topic. And um, you know what regulates the outcome of infection? There's really three things. There's the drug, the bug, and the host. Now, we can't do anything about a bug. You're infected with whatever you get infected with. And we can't do anything about the host. The only thing that you really can do anything about is the drug. So the drug is the only thing that we control. We can make a good drug better by optimizing the pharmacodynamics. Uh, but to do that, you need to know what the MIC is. It's the only concrete piece of information that we have. Now, there's a lot of uh, interest in tests, PCR tests, for resistance genes. And you see a lot of them at this meeting. And so, but when you test for a resistance gene, although that's very helpful in terms of infection control, and it might even be helpful in terms of modifying your treatment, but if a gene is absent, it doesn't mean that the organism is susceptible. There could be other resistance genes present. You know, there's 1,800 beta-lactamase genes now. So you're testing for five or six, that's nothing. It could be any number of them there that you're not testing for. Or resistance could be due to something like a porin mutation or an efflux pump. And so the absence of a gene doesn't mean the organism is susceptible. Conversely, if a gene is present, it doesn't necessarily mean the organism is resistant. For example, a CTX gene is actually a cefotaximase. So it rapidly hydrolyzes cefotaxime, but it doesn't hydrolyze ceftazidine. So if you really want to know what you can use to treat a bug that has a CTXM gene, you'd have to do a susceptibility. You can't deduce anything other than cefotaxime. Oxes will hydrolyze piptazo and carbapenems, but they don't hydrolyze third-generation cephalosporins. But how will a physician know this? They won't, not if all you do is report the resistance gene. So testing for resistance gene is not enough. Clinicians still want susceptibility results. Now, for every antibiotic, a concentration is established for use in interpreting the MIC, and it's called the breakpoint. It's published when the drug is first approved by the FDA, and it's in the drug package insert. And it's also listed by organizations like CLSI. In general, a published breakpoint is two to four twofold dilutions below the achievable blood level when the antibiotic is given at the usual recommendation. And there are many breakpoint setting groups in the world. CLSI is one of them. FDA sets breakpoints. UCAST sets it for the European group. There are breakpoint setting groups in Asia, China, Japan, Australia. And each of them uses a different mechanism for determining the breakpoint. In the US, we use the blood level of the drug. So whatever level you can achieve in the blood, that's the basis for setting the MIC breakpoint. But in other countries, it might be the level of the antibiotic that is achieved in tissue uh, or sites other than blood. 
some breakpoint setting committees use how much of the drug is protein bound as part of the equation. And so there isn't universal acceptance on how to set a breakpoint. Here's an example of the piptazole breakpoints between the US CLSI and UCAST. So for Enterobacteriaceae, CLSI says any MIC that's less than 16 is susceptible. But UCAS calls 16 intermediate. It has to be less than 8. Now, the MIC is the same. They have the same Vitec and the same Microscan and the same Phoenix in Europe that we use here. They test the bug in the same standardized way. They get the same MIC, but it's reported with a different breakpoint. So they might call it resistant. We would call it susceptible or intermediate. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, CLSI used to say 64. Anything 64 or lower was susceptible for pseudomonas. And then in 2012, they decided to change the breakpoint and lower it to 16. Well, 16 harmonizes with the UCAS breakpoint of 16, but we have different resistance breakpoints. In the Europe, any pseudomonas that is above 16 for Piptazo is called resistant. But in the US, it has to be above 128 before it's resistant. So how do these breakpoints get determined? In CLSI and UCAS, they, they pretty much use the same formula. They look at the distribution of MIC or zone diameters obtained when testing on a wild type population. So you go out and you collect E. coli from all these different sources, and you test them, and you see what MICs they have. And a lot of them will be very susceptible. Some of them will be resistant. And you sort of say, OK, so here's the line. Anything on this side of the line is resistant. Anything on this side of the line is susceptible. So that's one piece of information. Uh, it's called the wild type distribution or the epidemiologic breakpoint. You can look at attainable concentrations over time of the active form of the drug, either in plasma or at the site of infection. So again, if you know that you can get a concentration of 8 micrograms of a drug at the infection site, and the MIC is some number less than 8, it would be susceptible. But if the MIC is above 8, it's not going to work because you can't get that much to the site. So we look at the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the organism. And the last thing we look at is the, if we have it, any kind of clinical correlation. If a patient, if we called an MIC of 8 susceptible and um, that patient had uh, an infection, and it was called susceptible at MIC of 8, and they were successful in treating, that would be good. That would support that MIC. When CLSI changed the piptazole breakpoint for pseudomonas from 64 down to 16, it was because there were reports of people who had MICs of 64 that the lab was calling susceptible, but they were failing therapy. And so there was clinical evidence that the MIC breakpoints weren't working. And so took a new look at it and decided to harmonize with UCAS to use 16. But all three of these things are used. There's a lot of science applied. But still in all, everybody doesn't agree on what the breakpoint should be. So for Piptazo, the epidemiologic cutoff sort of suggests 16 would be a good breakpoint. But based on the pharmacokinetics and where the infection is and how much drug you give, you might support a breakpoint of 4 or 8 or 16 or 32. A lot of drugs have multiple dosing recommendations. Cefepime can be dosed six different ways. When you look at the cefepime package insert, there's six different ways that a physician can dose it. So how are you going to pick a single breakpoint when you don't know what the dosing regimen the physician is ordering? We never know that in the lab. And then clinical data. You know, so knowing that, which breakpoint do you think is correct? Can you tell? You all got silent. <laughs> well, it's almost impossible to tell. It really has to be individualized for each patient if you really want to know. So the MIC is only one piece of information that's useful in deciding whether an antibiotic is going to be successful. There'll never be. There will never be a single breakpoint that will predict susceptibility and resistance to a drug for all patients at all sites under all conditions. The only thing that you have that is definite and definitive is the MIC. 
Breakpoints can vary by infection site. You see that. We have for strep pneumo different breakpoints for meningitis versus non-meningitis. Uh, they can vary by method of antibiotic administration. FDA and CLSI breakpoints are based only on the drug level achieved in the blood. But how often are we reporting susceptibility on bloodstream infections? Think about it. Of all the antibiotic reports that you send out every day, how many are on bloodstream infections? Well, I can tell you what it is at Loyola, it's 11%. So 89% of the reports that we issue every day are not even on bloodstream infections, yet the breakpoints are based on bloodstream infections. So if it's urine or if it's tissue or if it's spinal fluid uh, or if it's decubitus, we're just guessing that that breakpoint works at those sites. What we really need to do is assess a whole bunch of things to determine if that MIC is a good MIC. We need to know the organism, we need to know the MIC, we need to know the site of infection, we need to know the drug concentration that gets to that site. We need to know the renal function of the patient, the protein level. Why the protein level? Because antibiotics are protein bound. If you have a high protein level, more drug is bound, the bound portion's inactive. If you're uh, spilling protein, you have a low protein level, a lower dose would work maybe better. The method of administration, is it IV or oral? The dosing convenience, a lot of times, whether you want to give something. Uh, when I say method of administration, I mean if you're going to give IV, are you going to give it with a 30-minute infusion, a one-hour infusion, a four-hour infusion? What's the potential for drug-to-drug -drug interactions? What are patient allergies? What's the cost of the drug? You see, it's very complicated. And so to be putting SI and R on a report, to me, is very misleading. What we really need on every antibiotic result is a PharmD consult. We happen to have one here. He's going to be our next speaker. And so I would just ask you these questions. Is it time to move past the concept of the universal breakpoint? Is it time to move past looking for resistance genes? Is it the MIC that drives the choice of antibiotic therapy? And if it's yes to all of the above, wouldn't it be great if we had a fast and accurate method for generating MIC results? Let's think about it. Thank you.